Honorable Vice President, sir, with your permission, if we could commence this evening's proceedings. Before I formally request the Vice President to lead the tributes and we proceed with the meeting, may I first of all request all of you to very kindly put your phones in silent or discreet as the case may be. And this is not only because it's a memorial meeting, it's one of the protocols we recommend. And I've said this in the past, that if some of you are not very sure how your phone is put into silent or discreet, please look right, look left, I'm sure somebody can help you to make sure you press the right button. On behalf of uh, Mr. Subramanian's family, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the presence of all of you over here. Before I request the Honorable Vice President to lead the tributes to Subo, as it were, there is a brief clip, a film that's been made on Sri Subramanian. So we'll have that film on first, and then I'll request the Honorable Vice President. And we have a few other speakers whom I shall request progressively. How old were you? We all this before I was five. I finished my school in the I was totally absorbed in the Second World War. It's a very funny thing in those days was we were living in Ramnadhuram. Ramnadhuram had just got electricity. Our house didn't have electricity. And uh, in the whole of the town, the brush is fast in there. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Where did it come from? The earliest memory is one day I fell and cut my tongue. Cut away? Half of the tongue. And you can even press the scar still there. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Where did it fall from? I was running across and fell on the, the, the doorstep. Oh, and then uh, my teeth cut the tongue. How old were you? We all this before I was five. I finished my school in the middle. I was totally absorbed in the Second World War. It's a very funny thing in those days was we were living in Ramnadhuram. Ramnadhuram had just got electricity. Our house didn't have electricity. And uh, in the whole of the town, there were some two, three radio sets. And we used to get newspapers one day later. From the glass, we used to come back here. I was at that time uh, 12, uh, no, 10, 11. But I was interested, I used to read the Hindu and English, in spite of the fact I, it, 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 my media instruction was coming. Uh, I learned English in the sense of uh, by reading the Hindu. My father used to ask me to read to him because his eyesight, especially to read Falkenberg, was So I used to read uh, the Hindu to him. And then I used to, uh, morning 7 o'clock news, I used to go from the house. There was one restaurant in the whole town where they used to have a radio. So I used to go and sit, start outside the restaurant to hear the radio news. <laughs> My earliest memories was, I used to go every morning to hear the news, radio news, before I went to school. And in fact, by some, uh, but a little later, everybody in the, uh, in the school knew I was one of those people who was doing it. So even my teachers used to ask me what they used to do. Similarly, there used to be some uh, municipal library where we used to get newspapers. Of course, in our case, uh, my father used to get Hindu. Uh, but then I used to go to that library in the evening and read up all the newspapers. Mostly, 
my total preoccupation at that time was about the war. I met my wife and her family in Delhi. My parents didn't uh, uh, admit them first. And therefore, I never was married by my family in America. Welcome to Bhakti Talk. Thank you. The world is a very different place. Yes, very much so. In the 50s and now. Yes, very much so. Well, at the time when I came here, uh, within a couple of years, we had Bhuganan and uh, Khrushchev visited Delhi. And uh, that is the time when the Indo Soviet relationship started developing. expert K. Subramaniam, who served in the Defence Ministry during the war, says that what happened in 1962 should not be a reason for not building trust with China today. China has become a friend of the uh, uh, United States after having fought the Korean War. Uh, I mean, a war in which Mao Zedong's son was killed, but still China had become a friend of the United States. In theory, carbon could have been avoided if you had theogonized carbon sector. That is only in your theory. But we are ourselves dismissed by saying it would be much too costly and that is not the way of doing it. Hopefully, everybody is still getting built up from you. And, yes. uh, as usual, following you. So <laughs> nobody in this country for 50 years has been able to stay ahead of you and made that. Thank you. Made like that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. May I now request our Honorable Vice President, Sri Hamid Ansari, to lead the tributes and hearty correction of Mr. Subramanian. And once the Vice President has led the tributes, I'll request Sri Indar Malhotra, Ekon Rajasik Singh, Sri Parthasarvi, and Sri Shankar Menon to also share their thoughts and recall of Subodhas. Hamid Samia. Mr. Subramanian, members of the family and friends, eulogiums by established tradition should be led by someone most qualified to pronounce an appropriate panegyric. I do not fulfill the requirement and therefore feel doubly honored to be the first speaker. We have gathered here today to offer comfort, not condolence, to the family of the late Shri K. Subramanian and 
to recall and celebrate the qualities of head and heart that enabled him to lead a life full of achievement and excellence in so many fields. He was a distinguished civil servant, a prolific writer, an institution builder, a thinker focused on matters of strategy and national interest, a man passionately attached to his convictions and yet receptive to discussion and dissent. Any one of these would be sufficiently satisfying to an ordinary mortal. Most in this audience and many more beyond it would readily agree that Shri Subramaniam's single biggest contribution to our national life was his lifelong focus on strategic thinking required to identify, promote and defend India's national interest. He would have endorsed Gladstone's dictum that policy should not foreclose or narrow the liberty of choice and freedom of action. Such an approach, he believed, could only be undertaken through a healthy and substantive discussion and by building up intellectual and material capabilities for India's requirements in an international system that is constantly in flux and in which India is emerging as an actor of some significance. Shri Subramaniam lamented the absence of substantive debate on matters strategic and the paucity and inadequacy of focused thinking and research on them in our society. A concerted effort to energize these would be our best tribute to him and his pioneering work. Thank you. Surachanaji, members of the family, Mr. Vice President, and friends and admirers of Subramaniam gathered here this evening. I must confess that it's a bit difficult for me to speak on this occasion. Emotion is one problem. The world and life doesn't look the same without Subramaniam as it used to be. Secondly, after the eloquent tribute paid by the Vice President and the well-deserved tide of tributes paid to him in India and abroad, there is very little left to add. Everybody but everybody has acknowledged that he was the strategic guru of India, the pioneer, pioneer who almost single-handedly taught this country, historically indifferent to strategic thought, to think about its national security and to do so strategically. I do not want to go over the ground which has been so well covered before, but I would add that one of his message not always understood very clearly was that for God's sake think about Indian security and strategy from the Indian or Indocentric point of view rather than regurgitate whatever is coming out of the think tanks of the Western countries, principally America. Uh, 
having one other thing I would say that Subramaniam has been one of those rare individuals who evoked glowing tributes not only after his passing but also often during his lifetime. And I do remember that uh, Uday was one of them who organized it that on his 75th birthday in 2004 not one but two festivals appeared. Both were full of glowing tributes to him, which he very eminently deserved. Again, I wouldn't recall them except for one thing, that is Steve Cohen of Brookings, somebody who knows uh, both strategy and South Asia very well, what he had to say. And let me be accurate in quoting him. Subhu, the most important strategic thinker of India, wrote Steve, is also one of the handful of world's truly original writers and speakers in that arena. And more important than that, uh, Subhu, uh, sorry, Stephen Cohn went on to say, until the post-1998 dialogue between Jaswan Singh and Steve Talbot, no other Indian had the same impact on American officials, scholars, and strategists as he did. To many of them, and these are Stephen's words, not mine, Subhu was India. Even those, and this is, I'm still quoting uh, Steve Cohen, even those Americans who considered Subhu to be anti-American, uh, respected his formidable intellect and unequaled mastery of facts and sense of humor. Now there is unfortunately some irony here because for very long years Subhu was often criticized for being a hawk and for being anti-American. And yet during the last eight or ten years when he kept saying that it was in the national interest of both India and the United States on both democracies and plural societies to cooperate and be together, there were many who said that he was excessively pro-American. And in the past he used to be denounced as a pro-Soviet person. So that is that he was thinking of national interest all the time didn't occur to his critics, many of whom were the same in both cases. I promise not to take your time in saying it, but two services that he rendered, I will, three, I'd like to mention. One, his contribution to the evolution of Indian nuclear policy was immense. Not all of it is well known. And I take this occasion to say that at one particular occasion, around the time when we were under greatest possible pressure, not to go nuclear, uh, Subhu very skillfully defeated somewhat underhand efforts of some of his colleagues in the government and policy making arena to subvert Indian nuclear policy. The nuclear doctrine he is the virtual author of. At that time the foreigners took great objection to the triad of deterrence and many Indians took great objection to no first use. Both are probably the best doctrines that he could have put forward. His services before and during the 1971 war for the liberation of Bangladesh are too well known for me to go over again. Now all I have to say, one other thing, that in my area where I have spent a lifetime communications I have not known any communicator better than him, whether in writing or in speech. There has been an occasion, particularly after the hijacking of the plane in which he was involved, that he arrived rather late, as Sir Ocharanji would remember, on Saturday night. I think early morning on Sunday, I rang him up to say that I would want an article and I'll put it on front page. He said he will send it 
to, by about 2 o'clock. I said, that's fine. But that also meant that I had to cancel a lunch that I had to go to. I went to office at about midday. Before 1 o'clock, the article arrived. I dealt with it and I went back to the lunch which I had canceled. And I have been at many speeches, particularly one where uh, our friend Uday completely startled both Subhu and Suruchana by doing great honors to him. He was taken aback. Now, then he delivered one hour dissertation on Indian strategy, national security, without a scrap of paper in front of him, without fumbling for a word, without any lack of sequence in his presentation, and most lucidly. I must end here to say that no matter how long the oldest of one present here can look back on, and no matter how long the youngest of us lives and can look forward to, I don't think we will see the like of him again. Mr. Subramaniam, your family, the Honorable Vice President, friends, I am not particularly qualified to speak on this occasion, but I saw him perhaps from a direction which not many of you would have seen him. I was sent with 24 hours notice from the Air Force after six years of a high pressure job in flight safety and operations to go to IDSA. This was in 1983. And for the next four years, I served under him. It altered my life. I lost some, but I gained enormously. The biggest gain was not so much that I became director subsequently. Well, that is one issue on which perhaps he and I had the longest argument because I did not want to be director and he thought I would be the best man. I don't know, history must make their judgment. But otherwise, it was a constant pace of learning. It opened up new life for me. I was fond of reading. I was new about books and stuff like that. Uh, wrote enough in the service as it is. Most of them were obviously classified. But now certainly there was opportunities. And from a man who is unquestionably, unquestionably India's leading strategic thinker. In that respect, he is with us, will remain with us for at least a century more, if not further than that. Because it's highly unlikely that somebody else, because in any case, the circumstances under which he actually spoke up with great courage of conviction and at the same time with a tremendous amount of logic and reason, being party to it for a long time, I think this is the greatest thing. At one level, we might think that we have lost something great. The other is that he's left behind a legacy which will be very difficult to match. But I think it will be something that actually makes India, a rising India, if I may use that word, something quite different. I recall once in 1985 itself when I used the term that it's inevitable that India will rise to power in relation to the other countries. He says, what is your basis of your judgment? Because he was a great person for facts. You could not actually, somebody who would try to argue only on the basis of opinion and not facts, has always had a difficulty with him and he had difficulty accepting their arguments. He thought far ahead of anybody else, at least in the type of people we may know. Uh, 
And the bottom line always was India's national interest. And when people accused him that he changed his mind, we talked at length about it even before that. His answer was very clear that the landscape on which you have to work has changed. It's not that we need to change. You have to adjust to the changed world situation and that is so in the coming years as he forecast and in the new equation of world power what Indians have to think about in being where they are. A man of great principles. I don't know Honorable Vice President how many people in this room will know that he was, the government had decided to award him Padma Bhushan and he turned it down before they could announce it. And he told, rang me up and I said, I have turned it down just now. So I said, yes sir. I said, um, but you deserve it. He said, maybe, maybe not, but it's my principle. And two aspects, number one, that a civil servant should not, which was the earlier thinking. And the second, he says, I'm against all these awards and other things, ceremonies. As a man, as a person, I found him extremely sensitive, in some circumstances even slightly shy, who could almost sort of flower out completely if you would question his judgment or his argument because he will always be better than anybody else. Very profoundly correct in his conduct. Let me give a small example, a minor one, but very crucial one. I took over as the director of IDSA from him. He did twist my arms in the process. Uh, looking back, history has to decide whether he was right in this or not. But after, during his fellowship at Cambridge, he had been awarded the Nehru Fellowship and the rules required that he has to be affiliated with an institution. He, I happened to be at the United Nations because of the disarmament conference, the third special session, a couple of weeks, and he rang me up from UK that I'm coming to New York. Uh, I want to talk to you. It was a pleasure to talk to him. The best part of my life was just that. He came and we talked and then he said, I have applied and I have been awarded a Nehru Fellowship, but I require to be affiliated to an institution. He said, would you allow me to put down IDSA as an institution? I said, sir, if you didn't do that, I will resign. At the minimum, I'll be very upset that after all this now you're showing and he had flown in from all the way. I said, but you could have run me up. He said, no, I have to ask your permission. You are the director. Can I put down ideas there as the institution to which I will be affiliated? And he was. That did create some difficulties in, in, in this great city of ours because I had not physically occupied his office I was in my office, which is not very different across the corridor. So from then itself, from there itself, I rang up. I said, this room has to be kept open, available and for Mr. Subramaniam when he comes back, if he's a, associated a, with, affiliated to IDSA, then he must have his place. Fortunately, it was his old room. A lot of people said, okay, now he is now going to run the IDSA uh, overlooking just his shoulders. Let me tell you this, that throughout the 14 years, never once did he interfere in my decision making in ideas. Not once. Lots of people went up to him with complaints or praise, whatever it was. Not once. Not that he did not give me advice, otherwise whether I was going right or wrong, 
but no way would he actually convey to be in any form, in any form, in a daily talk, a daily conduct, daily behavior, he would simply say, this is your business, you are the director, you have to take this decision. He did. In fact, for often he was when I said, but this is a problem, that is a problem, he used to smile away and said, you know, these are the pleasures of being a director. And I have gone through that. Man of great integrity, a man of great courage. Personally to me it will be inadequate totally to use any words. Because till lately, till perhaps about two weeks ago, I continue to ring him up or meet him for advice, thinking where it is. And he did not mind if I did not actually follow that advice. But he did never hesitate to give his advice. I had requested him to be a member of the Board of Trustees when we set up this new trust and a think tank. He happily agreed. And he said, keep, keep it going. On my 75th birthday, these friends of mine, the old IDSA Mafia, they got together and forced me to give a lecture. He was not well, but he came. He came to listen and he walked up to say a few words and then presented to me, which I value immensely, a wristwatch. He says, I am giving you this to watch over India's national security. I said, sir, I will try my best. And I will try my best to keep up his legacy, his teachings, his things, as long as I am able to do so. Thank you very much. Mr. Subramaniam, Sulochana, Suloch, as I have known you since 1948, uh, even earlier, <laughs> uh, Mr. Vice President, Honorable Vice President, uh, friends. Uh, I'm here, uh, really I feel honored to speak on such an occasion. Uh, I'm not sure if I can adequately fill the bill uh, to, for a eulogy on Mr. Subramaniam, uh, my guru. Uh, I first uh, met Mr. Subramaniam uh, after Sulo and he were married when he was in Madras. And what I record about him was that he uh, was working with my father who was not only the chief secretary but also the development commissioner. And my father had these young bright IAS guys who ran the show. Uh, they were uh, K.B. Ramanathan. Uh, the um, Venkat Ramanan, Data Finance Secretary, Mr. Subramaniam, and T.N. Session. Uh, many years later, I asked my father, after he retired, what was it you liked most about that Panchayati Raj period when you worked at Kamrad's behest to see that Tamil Nadu produce the first and best uh, Panchayati Raj set up in the country? It was then known as community development and not rural development, if I recall. And he told me, he said, you know, I used all these youngsters, but the brightest was K. Subramania. When it came to Bandobast, I gave it to Session. When it came to finances, I gave it to Venkat Ramanat. But when it came to conceptualizing how Panchayati Raj should be put in place. I had Subramaniam travel with me and Mr. S.K. Day, then Minister for Community Development, I think Sulochi will remember, all across the state. 
And it was Subramaniam who was worked with me in conceptualizing the legislation we put together for community development across the state. He said Subramaniam alone had the drive. But another secret is apart from Subramaniam's passion for defense, a motivating factor that is charging away from my father who spoke to the then cabinet secretary as soon as he finished Panchayat Raj and heading for defense was Suroch's father, Mr. Jai Shankar. Was, if I recall right, Suroch, then the head of the Hindustan Aeronautics after having spent a lifetime in the defense ministry. What I'm trying to say is Mr. Subramaniam and Suloch were a team who produced these great four kids uh, in uh, Vijay, in uh, Jai Shankar, in Sanjay and Sudha. And it was a, the, the family was a think tank. I'll never forget one day, I, I kept harassing them, I kept harassing Mr. Subramaniam every day after I retired. I think Suloch must have got tired of the morning telephone call from me, even when Mr. Subramaniam was well. And the important thing was, she tried and tell me he was not unwell and he couldn't speak. And said, no, I want to speak. And he taught me many things after I retired. I have not gone to the strategic aspects of it, Mr. Indra, Indra Malhotra is dead. I'm going to the human aspects. I walk into this uh, uh, Subramaniam dining room and I have uh, uh, young Dhruva, the grandson, arguing vehemently with his father, uh, with his grandfather. Uh, we had something to do with uh, the, I, if I recall correctly, with the Bush visit. Uh, I joined in in the argument. And uh, when Jai Shankar's wife, Kyoko, Jai Shankar, you were headed for office on that day, I think, uh, walked into the dining room and I said, look, Kyoko, I'm, I'm very sorry in all this noise. She says, don't worry, this happens every morning at the dining table. That was the Subramaniam family. And to me, what he taught me was he said, whatever you write, be honest to yourself. Uh, and uh, honestly, uh, I couldn't think of a person with that integrity. Turning down the Padma Bhushan was the least. When he went back to Tamil Nadu in 1975, Whereas every bureaucrat across the country was trying to make his name by being more loyal than the king in rigorously enforcing the emergency. In, in Tamil Nadu, which was then under president's rule, he ensured that while certainly orders were carried out, people were treated humanely and with dignity. That speaks for itself. Uh, of the greatness of the man. And the other aspect, I think, uh, in this area, uh, which uh, uh, Suloch being an Iyengar married to an Iyer, if I may say, uh, is, is that, that the, the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the fact is that in this era, there is very little of understanding in Hindu mythology terms of the importance of goddess Saraswati, which was the goddess of knowledge. Today, the focus of our society is on, for the wrong reasons, on the goddess of Lakshmi and the acquisition of wealth. Mr. Subramaniam believed that knowledge transcends wealth and is more important than wealth. That was the message he sent with the simplicity of his lifestyle, which was a model to others, that learning is more important than wealth. Uh, he's no more with us, Suloch, but what I will say is to quote from a poem that people like him Leave, his foot, leave their footprints on the sands of time. He won't be forgotten. Thank you.
this vice president sir uh, mr subramanian members of the subramanian family i see uh, many familiar faces from the pages of my newspaper uh, uh, columnists consulting editors i uh, after all the speakers who spoken already i am not sure i can i can come here with a claim of knowing more about mr subramanian uh, i never worked with him that closely but i for almost 30 years i've been a journalist for 33 years maybe 30 maybe 40 years because i studied botany zoology chemistry but my mother very often caught me reading uh, not pornography as teenagers would but uh, books on military history and st and strategic issues and she used to get very fu really furious with me and she used to say what will this mean uh, to you you are going to become a doctor but i was never destined to become a doctor and among the things that i read those days under the covers of biology books was mr subramanian's articles um uh, i will only tell you a few stories i am a journalist i am a storyteller uh he was a big name for many of us who read him as, as students and then as young journalists because there was a time say until uh, mid 80s when he was probably the only voice on strategic issues in india uh, he is the one who set the agenda he is the one who implemented the agenda he is the one who told the rest of us about it and he is the one who gave lines to the rest of us uh, and then you found that this universe began to widen and when this universe began to widen many more names came up uh, and there was no surprise as one as one discovered having gotten to know him better later that almost all these names had come out of his little school and not all of them agreed with him uh, not all of them in fact all of them did not agree with him on everything and yet they all grew in their own fields in their own areas i also uh, i don't find raja here see raja mohan who now works 